Nestled in the Kent countryside, Hever Castle was built in the 13th century and converted to a manor house by Sir Geoffrey Bullen, alternatively spelt Berlin, in 1462. Geoffrey began his career as a hat maker, transitioning to mercery, trading in cloth and haberdasheries, before being appointed Sheriff of London from 1446 to 47, and finally as a Minister of Parliament in 1449. Thomas Boleyn inherited the castle in 1505 and lived there with his wife, Lady Elizabeth Howard, and their children George, Mary and Anne Boleyn, destined to be Henry VIII's second wife. Upon Thomas's death in 1539, Hever became a crown property of Henry VIII, but was bestowed to Anne of Cleves as part of the divorce settlement in 1540. The castle passed through three owners before being purchased in 1903 by the fabulously wealthy American William Waldorf Astor, and most recently by the Guthrie family in 1983, who were the present guardians of one of our nation's finest homes. Enjoying a long soak in a deep bubble bath before my first night's recording, I was startled to hear a lady in my room say a bright and cheery, Hello! Getting out of the bath in a hurry, I assumed a member of staff had entered my room, not knowing I was there. Whilst apologising for not closing my doors, I stuck my head around the corner. There was no one there, and the door was firmly locked. As an instinctive reaction, I immediately put my recorder on, hoping that whoever my surprise visitor was might still be around. The voice I captured doesn't sound like the lady I heard at all, but I most certainly wasn't alone the welcoming committee had most definitely arrived. Well, I'd like to raise a toast to the library of us that spoke. And to you, I just wish I'd had the record again now. And to you, I And to you, I I wondered how long it would be before note of our favourite Tudor liege was heard. I wasn't to be disappointed. Apparently he's off to walk abroad. It's not unheard of for equipment to unexpectedly fail and for batteries to drain when recording in historic buildings and ancient sites. But the atmosphere in the Astor Wing bedroom was so peaceful I was genuinely surprised when two of the dictaphones died at the same time. Those are now full, even though they were drained before. There's obviously someone around. Eva has a history of glittering socialite parties. A well-spoken gentleman's voice is very distinctive of a bygone era. It's impossible to identify who he is, but his message is flattering and most welcome. While staying at Hever as a guest, you're fortunate in gaining access to the castle early in the morning before the scrum of visitors arrive. This was to be a precious time to record in relative peace and quiet. In common with nearly all locations where I've captured voices, the language used by speakers who communicate through EVP isn't as we might expect, especially given the historic surroundings. Although some accents and vocal inflections are identifiable, all clips are in modern English. I don't consider this to invalidate the communications as being evidential. It's merely an aspect of the communication we have yet to fathom. Although it would be easy to attribute certain messages to specific individuals given the location, it's impossible to be certain. Having listened, you should make up your own mind as to who you think they may be. Walking into the inner hall, 
the atmosphere is of a warm and welcoming home. William Astor is to be congratulated for the transformation of Hever. The renovations suit the castle handsomely. During the period of occupation by the Boleyn family, this room would have been considerably plainer. It was part of the medieval kitchen, although you'd never know it now. It's very easy to be fooled by its new clothes. The first voice to greet me at the castle sounds distinctly unimpressed by my arrival, and his accent is decidedly more cockney than medieval. There are only two people who ever called me Racco, and this isn't either of them. During the Boleyn's occupation, the now sumptuous drawing room was a larder adjacent to the kitchen. I wonder if those who remain residing on a different frequency see the luxurious room as it appears today or in its former decorative state. Either way, those around me are clean to let me know that my presence has been acknowledged and a member of the household is on their way to greet me. <laughs> Asked to commission the architect, Frank Loughborough Pearson, to renovate the drawing room. His inspiration for the stunning bog oak and holly panelling came from the Elizabeth Chamber at Sizerg Castle in Cumbria. Noting for the recording that I was physically alone in the area, the gentleman lets me know that company is on the way. I am the only person in here at the moment. Personally, I couldn't ask for any more in an EVP than this, because it answers so many questions. Astor had a keen interest in the occult, as did his friend the eminent spiritualist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. A collection of Astor's crystal balls is housed in the library, but sadly out of sight. Knowing of their joint interest in parapsychology, I don't think it would be too presumptive to guess that the entertainment in the evenings may have included attempted post-mortem communication. It's curious when we bear in mind Astor and Conan Doyle's interest, the next speaker is plainly aware of what I'm doing. His acknowledgement of the phenomena means a great deal to me. EVP such as this gives me motivation to continue researching. Back in the library now. Sir Arthur was a canny researcher and would actively challenge mediums he encountered. This next capture makes me question whether I'm being challenged as one of his test subjects. The staging of the morning room beautifully illustrates how the room would have been used in Tudor times by the ladies for quiet pursuits such as needlecraft and conversation. To me it had a rather odd atmosphere, almost an expectation of something about to happen, but nothing did aside from a rather puzzling EVP. <laughs> The word montry has a Latin derivation meaning to show or reveal. What was it the speaker was trying to disclose and would I find it at Hever? Climbing the stairs for the first time, 
I had an increasing sense of expectation about who I may record. With each step, the feeling of being accompanied on the stairwell became stronger, and the voice of a speaker certainly sounds as if they're close to me. Arriving at the top of the staircase, you arrive in this small room, which is said to have been Anne's bedchamber, although this hasn't reached consensus among historians. The suite of following rooms would have been used by all the Bolin family, as their accommodation and living area, where most of their day would have been spent. Being told to hush, the present tense of the next speaker suggests they are continuing their daily lives, as they would have done 500 years ago. To Anne Boleyn's bedroom. It sounds as I may have arrived at an inopportune time. Before moving into the next room, my attendance is announced, before another speaker checks if Anne is still in prayer. Matins and Vespers were said eight times a day. Anne was an intelligent and learned young woman. The Book of Hours is stunningly beautiful. The colours remain bright and it's easy to see why it's still a treasured heirloom. A handwritten entry highlights her thoughtfulness. Remember me when you do pray, that hope doth lead from day to day, and Berlin. Absolutely beautiful inscription. <laughs> In a room with an atmosphere so strong you can reach out and touch history, five portraits of Henry VIII's wives hang on the walls. With a mannequin of the great man himself, I can almost feel his presence. Might this be the voice of Henry asking why I'm calling? Built by Thomas Boleyn in circa 1506 to link both wings of his house, the staircase gallery originally featured a central staircase, however, more recently, the structural layout of the castle was significantly changed by William Baldorf Astor. The atmosphere was so vibrant here that capturing two vocal passerbys wasn't a surprise. My apologies for the foul language of the first gentleman. It appears time hasn't tempered his attitude. <laughs> The comment of the second gentleman is most curious. Oxygen was discovered in 1774, when Timothy Waldo was the owner of Hever. Does this place the speaker as after this date? There are many fine paintings lining the panels of the gallery. Elizabeth's portrait is stunning. As I admire the detailing of her dress and ruff, the voice of a whispering gentleman is captured. I could find no record of her visiting the castle, but she often travelled to nearby Penshurst Place. It 
It's believed that Henry stayed at the castle during his courtship with Anne. This room recreates what his chamber might have looked like. The ceiling is original, but the panelling is slightly younger, dating to the 16th century. It's now understood that during this period, the room would have been included in the servant's wing and would have appeared far less luxurious. These are the voices of a man and woman. I doubt it's Anne and her musician, though. Sir Edward Waldegrave and his family lived at Hever from 1557 to 1715. He was a staunch Catholic and added a secret oratory to his room in 1584 so that he and his family could celebrate Mass in safety. Those who didn't support the state religion were seen by the state as a threat, especially if they were a notable figure in society that held influence. It wasn't mention of Sir Edward I captured here but possibly another reference to Sir Arthur. <laughs> Leaving the staircase gallery and ascending the stairs, we enter the long gallery which runs across the entire width of the castle for 98 feet, perfect for parading and taking exercise when the weather was inclement. Decoratively, it excels in every way, with a fine collection of Tudor portraits and the most magnificent ceiling constructed in the 20th century by British sculptor Nathaniel Hitch. It was reputedly at the end of the corridor that Henry would hold court on his visits, the raised dais would be appropriate for his elevated status. Leaving the long gallery, you enter a small corridor, leading to a row of pretty single bedrooms, enchantingly decorated by the asters. It sounds like the renovations aren't quite over, although the window looks perfect to me. <laughs> One of the most enjoyable things about staying at a castle is the opportunity to wander the grounds in the evenings. Just sitting quietly, taking in the heady perfume and absorbing the atmosphere is something that always recharges my batteries. Natural environmental factors can make recording outside a challenge, but this night was both perfectly still and quiet. Aside from the bird song and passing aircraft, my time in the garden was quiet and uninterrupted, by the living at least. The clarity of the first speaker captured in the garden is astonishing and sounds to be close by. Anomalous sounds are an infrequent feature in recordings, but rarely are they so loud and so distinct. At the time of recording, I heard neither the gentleman nor the whistle. It was twilight as I stood browsing the herbs for the sick border. Out the corner of my eye, I saw a black figure, which was followed by the sound of something that would once have been common trundling the paths. A gentleman's voice is captured prior to me seeing the shade. Who did I just see on my right? It looked like a black figure. Coming down the path towards the herbs for the sick. They disappeared. It wouldn't be the dress, would it? Maybe not. Oh, that's weird. I heard someone trundling along with a wooden wheelbarrow. 
And there's nobody there. The sun had set and the bats were flying on the wing. As the temperature started to fall, I headed back in to transfer my recordings and to have a glass of wine before the evening investigation. The ambience of the Astor Lounge is at odds with its comfortable appearance. Whilst it looks to be the perfect place to cosy up with a book, there's an edge that I couldn't quite put my finger on, and soon I was to find out why. Of all the areas I recorded in, this was to be the most prolific and the most startling. I believe the next speakers are referring to an event that is in living memory, and not one I want an association with. Asking for a more explicit reply than I'm here, the response I get is concerning, and I believe in reference to the violent incident. The chance of maybe a bit more than I'm here. Who was liars? We talk about trick. My visit to Heaver Castle's flown by too soon. It's nearly time to leave. But first, whilst I pack up my belongings and equipment for the journey home, my recorder's on for any last messages. Although I could find no record of him as visiting the castle, it's always lovely to hear all his name, especially when I'm somewhere he would have known in his lifetime. It's a curious conversation regarding his finances, and one that I haven't been able to put into context. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed sharing my stay and hearing the wonderful voices of those who are still happy to reside at the castle. If you visit, remember to say hello to those around you. I promise they'll hear every word. Time to say goodbye. Please do join me on my next EVP adventure. It's always nice to have some company. Bye for now.